Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this episode of SciShow. Go to brilliant.org slash scishow to get started learning STEM for free, and if you're interested in an annual premium subscription, you'll get 20% off with our link. Artificial intelligence might make you think of sci-fi robots trying to take over the world and wipe out humanity. But in many ways, we're using artificial intelligence to help and even save human lives. One way scientists are doing this is by adding AI to the drug development process. Here's how it can help. Every year, there are thousands of new drugs in development at labs around the world. But only a tiny fraction of them make it through human trials, never mind final approval. And even among those that do get through, the majority of new medications are actually just newer versions of existing drugs, like cheaper generic versions. But there's a new hero in town with the potential to help things along. Drug discovery systems based on artificial intelligence. Even though the tech is still growing, several new drugs designed with the aid of AI are already in clinical trials. And together with other modern tech like fully automated robot scientists, AI is changing drug discovery in revolutionary ways. And it's accelerating the process beyond anything we've seen before. It's only recently that we've been able to create drugs from scratch. Some drugs are based on traditional remedies and natural products like aspirin. The first fully synthetic drug, the sedative chloral hydrate, was developed in 1869, but there was still quite a bit of trial and error involved. Rather than throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks, it was throwing chemicals at people to see if they stopped being sick. That's how, in 1932, we got sulfa drugs, when researchers at a chemical dye company discovered some of those dyes could be used to kill dangerous microbes. And pure random luck also did a lot for the early pharmaceutical industry. Most famously, if Alexander Fleming had been a little more fastidious about keeping his lab clean, we might not have penicillin. But all that has changed. Starting in the latter half of the 20th century, we've seen the rise of rational drug design. And that means no more spaghetti throwing. Instead, scientists build drugs from the ground up, driven by hypotheses of how they might work. Having so much data to rely on can be a double-edged sword, though. In fact, in a sense, you could say we've gotten too good at this. The number of researchers and person hours it takes to investigate every single drug candidate is truly monumental. But now, artificial intelligence is turning the tables by helping to guide and accelerate this process. It's helping identify drug candidates we might not have found otherwise, and cutting years off their development. AI systems can be given a general description of what we want to find, analyze a bunch of literature and databases, and pick out the best hits for later research. This starts right at the beginning. Before you even think about how your new drug would work, you have to decide what to design it for. You need a target. That target is one of the dominoes in the sequence of things that happens in your body to create a disease. It could be a mutated gene, or an enzyme that's working harder than it should. There's usually a huge body of scientific literature devoted to the disease you want to treat. Stuff like research articles, clinical trial reports, and patient records. Deciding on a target based on all this information is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And it's a lot to ask of our brains. AI can help us see the big picture, then pick out the one really specific thing we needed from that big picture. AI systems use a bunch of different technologies to do that. But generally, the key is natural language processing. Natural language processing is basically what allows your phone's voice assistant to understand you when you say, play something by Tchaikovsky. If you're lucky, we'll understand that you want to hear any music composed by Tchaikovsky instead of a specific piece he wrote called something. Now, the AI doesn't really understand what a Tchaikovsky is. But by analyzing the relationships between the words and the context, it can tell that you want to look for Tchaikovsky in the part of its database that holds a list of composers. And the principle is the same with drug discovery. So even though AI doesn't understand what a gene is, if you instruct it to sort through the literature on a given disease, it can identify the ones that stand out. It can also find places in the literature that talk about that gene, and look at the words connected with it. Do the authors refer to it often in the context of that disease? And crucially, do they talk about a causal relationship? If so, the AI can conclude that that gene is worth a look. Natural language processing also means that an AI system doesn't need this info to be pre-formatted by an army of people. You can feed it things written by a human, like scientific articles or medical case reports. So AI-based systems can analyze enormous amounts of data and give us meaningful answers. And they're much faster readers than we are, so they can go through way more information and handle way more complex than humans alone. Plus, they never need to duck out for coffee. This vastly speeds up the process of finding potential drug targets that we might have found eventually, but it also makes it possible to find completely new targets that we might not have noticed. For example, researchers at the US company Berg grew cancerous and healthy cells from over a thousand donors in petri dishes. They varied the conditions and tracked the unbelievably complex chemistry that results from cells simply doing their thing. They ended up with trillions of pieces of data from those samples. That's a lot of raw info about what happens in a cancer cell compared to a 
healthy one, which is to say, too much. The amount of data they had was so gigantic that without AI, it would have effectively been useless. But their AI system was able to analyze this data and identify various molecules that were out of whack in the cancer cells compared to the healthy ones. This suggested a new cancer drug target, a molecule called coenzyme Q10. And a new drug candidate they developed based on that AI discovery is now in clinical trials for pancreatic cancer and squamous cell carcinoma. So now we know what we want to target with a novel drug, which means we need a novel drug, meaning it's time to identify and synthesize chemical compounds that will hopefully hit that target in just the way we want. But how do you choose what to synthesize? Even before AI helpers, researchers were able to make educated guesses about what would work by looking at the chemical features of substances that they already knew could interact with the target. That interaction doesn't have to be beneficial. If something sticks to your target, that gives us a clue for how to design something new that'll stick to it as well. Even if researchers knew what chemical features they want their drug candidate to have, that may still mean thousands of options. And AI systems come to the rescue here as well. Scientists can tell the AI what chemical parameters they're looking for, and the system will not only find suitable candidates, but cut the list down to those that will potentially work best. The process is kind of similar to things like using AI for image recognition. When you do an image search for cats, you may get 99 images of felines and one gorgeous kitten-looking cloud. Because of those occasional blunders, the AI doesn't actually make the decision. Scientists still evaluate the results, and the AI system only helps automate and accelerate the grunt work. But like, that's really helpful. For example, by using AI to help choose chemical compounds, the makers of a new candidate drug for obsessive compulsive disorder were able to cut down their development cycle from around five years to one and get their candidate into clinical trials. Once you've decided on a drug candidate and synthesized the right chemical, it's time for testing. But before human tests and before animal tests, researchers start with simpler assays. That means testing the chemical using cultured cells or cell-free cocktails containing the drug's potential target. It used to take years to do this preliminary testing for a single potential medication. But in the 21st century, pharmaceutical companies have turned to robotic high-throughput screening, which makes it possible to test hundreds of thousands of compounds in a single day. A human might have to pipette the hundreds or thousands of candidate compounds into one cell culture dish at a time, but a robot can quickly zip through a bunch of them. A researcher can just design the experiment and then check the results. Like the Voltron of modern pharmaceutical science, a bunch of autonomous capabilities can also be combined into what's called a robot scientist. That system uses AI to identify specific experiments with a lot of potential, and then autonomously use lab equipment to perform these experiments and fine-tune its decisions of where to go next based on the results. For example, Eve, an AI-equipped robot scientist at the University of Cambridge, has already identified a new potential treatment for malaria. Eve first identified a list of compounds that may counteract malaria, then screened them against yeast cells in culture to see which of those chemicals worked best. This way, the Cambridge team was able to report that Eve had identified the well-known antimicrobial compound triclosan as a candidate to help combat treatment-resistant strains of malaria. Even with all this futuristic tech, though, only a few dozen new drugs are approved every year. For example, in 2019, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved 48, but only 20 of them were actually distinct enough from existing medications to be considered truly new. That's because discovering a new drug and bringing it to market is an expensive, long, and difficult process. To develop one new drug candidate, researchers need to screen up to 10,000 compounds, and on average, only five of those turn out to be good enough to go into clinical testing. If it gets that far, a drug candidate needs to complete three phases of clinical trials. Of those, 90% fail to gain FDA approval. And that's why developing a new drug may take up to 15 years and cost around $1.3 billion each. But smart AI systems like the ones we've talked about today are in a position to change that. We're only beginning to see the results of this AI revolution in drug discovery. There are literally hundreds of companies developing AI-based systems for the pharmaceutical industry. Human scientists still drive the process. And while machines are great at finding patterns and sorting through all of the information in a hurry, our brains can do a whole lot that machines can't. But the help that AI represents is already truly revolutionary. It can cut the time and cost necessary to develop a drug, and by doing so, it's widening that pipeline of potentially life-saving treatments. When candidate drugs inevitably flunk out because they don't work or aren't safe for us to use, this technology ensures there will be more waiting for us to test. And that's great for all of us, even if it means the future looks kind of like a robot handing us a miracle pill.
Because we each have a limited amount of time on this planet, having a robot lab assistant can speed up discoveries. But we still need to check AI's work. I mean, it would be kind of nice to let AI do things like tell us when potentially life-threatening events like earthquakes are coming, but humans might still be better at that too. Let's take a look at the comparison between human and AI earthquake detection. It's tough to miss a big building rattling earthquake, but even if we do not feel a rumble beneath our feet, it may still contain useful information for scientists. That's why 24 hours a day, seismographs are listening closely to the rumbles of our planet. In fact, there are over 13,000 active seismic stations out there, and that is far more data than seismologists have time to go through. Which is why, in a 2020 study, researchers set up a showdown of humans versus machines to sift through all this information and in the process, crown the heavyweight earthquake detection champion. One type of rumble that researchers are particularly interested in is called a teleseismic event. That's where the waves from a big earthquake, often a long way away, trigger another, usually much smaller earthquake. Geophysicists haven't come to a consensus on how one earthquake triggers another in this way, so figuring out when it happens and when it doesn't may help us predict which areas are most at risk of these remotely triggered rumbles. For the study, Published in the journal Frontiers in Earth Science, the researchers took data from seismic stations around Alaska to detect both small earthquakes and tremors caused by 30 larger quakes. Tremors are slower and weaker releases of energy than earthquakes are, which release their energy near instantaneously. Then, the researchers provided the data to our competitors. First up in the human corner, citizen scientists. Over 2,000 earthquake detectives volunteered for the study. They were not experts in seismology, just regular people who wanted to help out. They watched and listened to a small piece of the seismic data, converted into both a visible waveform and an audio file. The idea is that when we listen to sounds, our brains naturally do a great job of analyzing and classifying what we're hearing. In this case, you can easily identify earthquakes by a telltale sound similar to a slamming door. On the other hand, tremors sound like a train traveling over railroad tracks, and background noise can sound like anything from wind to static. So converting the initial data into a sound made it easier to spot the differences. Each of these pieces of data was classified by 10 detectives as an earthquake, a tremor, or just background noise. But they had competition. In the opposite corner was Team AI, a machine learning algorithm. This was a deep learning model, meaning it had the ability to classify data based on multiple features, as well as learn from its past guesses and refine its predictions. It identified earthquakes by comparing a section of unknown seismic data to a reference database where each event was identified by experts. Essentially, the algorithm took a piece of unknown data and found the most similar examples in that database to classify it. To figure out which team came out on top, the seismologist referees needed to identify some of the earthquakes themselves to figure out what the correct answer actually was. And after all that, the winner is… Team Citizen Science! Their earthquake labels were 85% accurate, nearly 10% better than the AI. They weren't quite as good at classifying tremors as they were earthquakes, but at the time, there was no AI that could detect tectonic tremors at all, so the humans still won out. Now, that does not mean the AI is out of the fight. After this initial showdown, things took an unexpected turn. The researchers used the Citizen Science data to train the AI to do a better job. In another study published a year later, the AI was able to surpass the humans at earthquake detection. This training even taught the AI to detect tectonic tremors for the first time ever. So maybe in the end, the moral of the story is humans and machines accomplish more by cooperating than by competing. It's likely AI will become an increasingly valuable tool for finding earthquakes, but the efforts of volunteer citizen scientists will still be needed to first point it in the right direction. This is the first time an AI has been trained to detect this kind of remotely triggered earthquake, so in the paper, the researchers encouraged other scientists to recruit volunteers to classify their data and grow the size of the AI training database. So humans will continue to help the robots get better at detecting these rumbles, which in turn could help predict the risk of future quakes and keep those humans safe. And while this particular project is over, if you're interested in doing some citizen science yourself, we will leave some links in the description. Detecting an earthquake before it strikes can be life-saving. But we can also design and use AI for all sorts of tasks, from scientific research to just making people's everyday lives easier. If you're enjoying learning about AI and want to learn more about computer science, you might enjoy a course from today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant has hands-on courses about science, engineering, computer science, and math, like their course Computer Science Foundations 
This course starts off with the basics of computer science and helps you learn about algorithms, data structures, and neural networks. Their courses are super interactive and include quizzes and guided problems with explanations. They're even available offline with their iOS and Android app, so you can take them anywhere. You can sign up with the link in the description or head to brilliant.org slash scishow to get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Who knows, after that course, you could move on to building your own robots. You could even take inspiration from some of the most advanced robots in the world. When I say robot, what do you picture? If it's a humanoid collection of metal and wires stomping around as it cleans your house or offers drinks to your guests, well, yeah, that would probably be considered a robot. And if you're imagining the opposite, with a Skynet-style intelligence destroying or enslaving humanity, well, they'd be robots too. But like we've pointed out before, the word robot is about as vague a term as you can get, at least in engineering. They really are just machines designed to accomplish a task, which could describe pretty much anything. But outside of the dictionary, we often take the word robot to mean one of those humanoid computers cooking you dinner. The thing is, there's a whole lot more to robots than that. What we call a robot tends to have some combination of two elements, mechanical flexibility and artificial intelligence, or AI. That's what it uses to accomplish its tasks. Depending on what they're designed to do, a robot might need more flexibility or a weirdly specific type of AI. And some, well, some are more successful than others. With such loose terminology, picking out the most advanced robots in the world is tricky and probably also kind of impossible since there's no universally accepted test for how advanced a robot is. It's subjective and your list might be different, but I'm gonna give you my list anyway. Some of these are robots that already exist and are doing amazing things, and others are just proofs of concept, hints of what the future will look like. The Da Vinci surgical robot, for example, gets a lot of attention because it's used all over the world. But it's actually kind of weird to think of a Da Vinci machine as a robot because it doesn't have much in the way of artificial intelligence. If you've seen that video of it stitching a grape back together, though, you know that it sure does have mechanical flexibility. With adjustable arms that can bend in ways that would break a human's wrist, Da Vinci is an incredibly flexible robot. It's also a robot in the sense that it's doing something that previously could only be done by humans. It works by using two main parts, a station with a few arms that actually operate on the patient, and a place for a human surgeon to sit and control it remotely. You don't just tell a Da Vinci bot, okay, go remove the patient's gallbladder now. The surgeon controls every part of the actual surgery. But the Da Vinci's arms are designed to scale down the surgeon's movements to be much more precise, and they're equipped with special cameras that allow the doctor to see what's going on at the surgical site, even through a tiny incision. It's the kind of thing a human surgeon would never be able to accomplish, because there are limitations to what human hands can do. But Da Vinci's capabilities have made some surgeries, like gallbladder removal, a lot less invasive than they used to be. Over the last decade, it's changed the world of medicine, and new versions are just getting better at what they do, giving surgeons greater control and flexibility. For example, newer models can be combined with fluorescence machines, where you dye the patient's blood with a compound called endocyanine green. When it's lit up by a laser, the dye emits green light, letting the surgeon more clearly see where the blood vessels are. But even though Da Vinci has lots of programming to make sure it's accurately translating the surgeon's movements, it doesn't need much AI, and in this case, you probably don't want the robot to be making decisions on its own. For the next robot on our list, which is really just the latest in a long line of robots, AI is a lot more important. I'm talking about Curiosity, the rover that's been exploring Mars since August 2012. Like Da Vinci, rovers aren't necessarily the first thing that might come to your mind when you think robot, but they're jam-packed with artificial intelligence, plus plenty of flexibility. Mars is far away. Depending on where Earth and Mars are in their orbits, it takes between 3 and 22 minutes for light to travel between the planets, so information isn't being transmitted any faster than that. And it takes double the time to get a response, since you have to send a signal both there and back. That's why modern rovers aren't just incredibly expensive remote control toys. It would be like trying to guide a remote control car, but having to wait half an hour every time you pressed a button. A huge waste of everybody's time. Instead, Every day, the mission scientists send Curiosity a new sequence of tasks to do, and it goes ahead and does them, mostly on its own. One thing that the rover has to be able to do really well on its own is navigate. The team can tell it where to go, but it needs to be able to avoid obstacles like dangerous rocks or cliffs along the way. Curiosity uses no less than eight cameras to map out the shape of the terrain three meters in front of it to plot out a bunch of different possible paths, and then it chooses the safest one. One of NASA's future rovers, called Mars 2020, is being designed on Curiosity's specs, so it must be an effective system. But when it comes to navigating through hazards terrain, some robots are designed to do a lot more than just roll over rocks. After the 2011 Fukushima disaster, DARPA started a challenge to motivate the best roboticists from all over the world to design robots that would be useful in natural disasters. In the DARPA Robotics Challenge, teams compete to have their robots quickly complete a series of tasks. 
one of which is a surprise. They have to do things like climb over piles of debris, open doors, and drive a car. Which, let's face it, some humans don't do all that well either. Mechanical flexibility is important, obviously, but they need some AI too, because the contest organizers figure that in a real disaster situation, communications won't be too reliable. So the teams have to plan to lose contact with their robot at any time. The tasks are so hard that some robots don't even complete the course at all. Some fall down and can't get back up, and others just take longer than the time limit, which for this year's challenge was an hour total for eight tasks. But the robot that took home the $2 million prize did complete the course, in under 45 minutes. The robot, called DRC Hubo, was designed by a team from the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Their strategy was to have the robot transform. It can walk on two legs if you want it to, but it can also scoot along on wheels embedded in its knees. This way, when it was working on things that might have knocked it off balance, like opening a door or drilling into a wall, it was a lot more stable. It also came equipped with plates on its legs, kind of like a bulldozer, so when it had to get past a pile of debris, it could just plow through it. Getting up a flight of stairs is also usually tough for a robot, because it needs to be able to see the stairs, but its knees get in the way. That's why Hubo walked up backward, spinning its torso all the way around so that its cameras had a clear view of where it was going. AI was important, but it was creative solutions in the flexibility department that won this robot the competition. Self-driving cars, though, those are all about AI. Companies are developing fleets of them, and the mechanical part is mostly figured out. They're basically just regular cars, except with spinning sensors on top that make them look kind of like submarines with whirling periscopes. The challenge is getting them to navigate highways and crowded city streets without banging into things, or people, and for that, you need lots of programming. The cars know all the rules of the road, and they're programmed to apply them to different situations, while avoiding hazards like pedestrians, bikers, and other cars. Google's fleet has already logged over a million kilometers on the road, and it turns out they're much safer drivers than humans, with only 14 minor accidents since the project started six years ago. And none of them were the car's fault. It helps, of course, that these robot cars have split-second reaction times, never get tired or distracted by text messages, and they can share all those kilometers of driving experience. And you might be able to buy one as soon as 2017. Self-driving cars use a type of AI that analyzes a situation and then decides what to do based on an incredibly complicated set of rules in its programming. Each car does that all on its own. They use a combination of cameras, radar, and lasers to keep track of objects on the road, plotting the trajectories of other cars, bikes, and pedestrians. That's a lot more sophisticated than, say, a Roomba. But then there are robot swarms, which decide what to do together, using something called collective artificial intelligence. And in 2014, researchers at Harvard created the first real working versions, 1,024 of them. They're a little more futuristic than the other robots, we've talked about, because robot swarms are still very much a new thing. They're a totally different way of approaching artificial intelligence and robotics, and now we know that it works. In collective AI, the programming is deceptively simple. Like some colonies of biological organisms, the robots are coded so that they follow a series of simple rules. This particular swarm was designed to organize itself into shapes, so the rules were basically just figure out where you are, and if you're on the edge of the swarm, move along until you find a spot where you're allowed to be that helps make that shape. That makes each individual bot a lot simpler to program, and all of them can work together without having to actively communicate. Eventually, this kind of technology could be used in fields like construction or medicine. If someone had an infection, for instance, you could just send a fleet of tiny robots into their bloodstream and have them seek out and destroy the virus or bacteria. A swarm of tiny simple robots or a set of surgical arms might not quite fit in with a Terminator, but when it comes to the most advanced robots in the world, they're on my list. Which robots would you have included in your list? Sure, Curiosity can navigate Martian terrain, but we can use AI to help us traverse our own terrain here on Earth. Even when we're driving cars, AI can help keep us safe from life-threatening collisions. Here's how. Driving can be pretty dangerous. In the US, over two and a half million people get injured in traffic accidents each year. That's about one person every 12 seconds. And hundreds of thousands of those accidents happen because of a distraction. Like you could be distracted by stuff going on around you, talking to another passenger, or just changing the car's temperature until something unexpected happens. So to keep our brains on track and our bodies safe, scientists are turning to artificial intelligence to learn how our minds handle distractions and help keep us in a mental sweet spot while we're driving. While you're driving on a busy highway, you might be simultaneously watching out for other cars, turning on the music, and talking to someone in the passenger seat, all while you're trying to maneuver multiple tons of steel going at least 80 kilometers an hour. And juggling all those tasks at the same time is what researchers call cognitive load, or workload. Generally, you'll want to keep your workload from getting too high. Otherwise, you're less likely to be able to respond to a sudden threat by doing things like changing lanes to get out of the way. And scientists are trying to find ways to measure this workload to design and engineer better cars and roads. But this isn't as straightforward as asking drivers directly how they're feeling. Because getting an already preoccupied driver to perfectly describe how much mental energy they're using 
might affect their workload by adding to it. After all, asking someone every couple seconds if they're distracted can be a bit distracting. But a workaround to this problem might be looking out for physical signs that someone's mind is working hard, like increased heart rate, and getting an idea of the size of their workload that way. Like in a study from 2014, researchers had 22 participants in a driving simulator doing an NBAC test. That's when you recall things from your memory based on a sequence of items, like numbers. So for example, someone might say the numbers 3, 7, 5, and participants are then asked to recall which number was read out two steps before, in this case 3, when the number 5 is read. The idea was to use the NBAC test to increase the workload of each driver. While this test was happening, researchers measured participants' heart rates and how much electricity their skin conducted. And scientists found that both their participants' heart rate and skin conductance increased when the task was made harder. And their driving behavior, like how well they stayed in a lane, changed as well, but not as drastically. In another 2014 study, the same researchers flipped the script. They recruited even more participants to drive on real highways while performing the NBAC test on and off at periodic intervals. Then they used the data they collected to train an algorithm to recognize when the participants were doing a task and experiencing a higher workload. The algorithm used heart, skin, and driving data for when the task was being done and when it wasn't, so it could tease out features in the data that helped distinguish between high and low workloads. And it worked. The algorithm was able to determine whether a driver was or wasn't experiencing a high workload with 90% accuracy. But if strapping an electrocardiogram to measure your heart rate while you drive sounds stress-inducing, scientists are exploring other ways of measuring workload, too. For instance, scientists could use functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS, which shines infrared lights near a person's skin and measures how much light bounces back. The amount of light absorbed by the person's blood can tell scientists the amount of oxygen in the blood. And the whole setup can be made small enough to fit into a headband, which someone could wear so that the scientists could measure the oxygen content of the blood in their brain. If there's a lot of oxygen around, their brain is working hard. Using the data collected by the FNIRS headband, the same researchers developed another algorithm that could also be used to measure the driver's workload in a simulator while they used the NBAC test. And the algorithm worked pretty well in this scenario, too, with an accuracy of around 80%. With effective ways of measuring a driver's workload, the hope is that car makers can test out different interfaces in future cars with real drivers, to find designs that are simple and safe to use. In fact, new cars could even include indicators for how distracted a driver might be in real time, so that they can change their behavior or slow down to manage their cognitive workload while driving, sort of like a fuel efficiency gauge, but for the mind. All these studies covered when drivers get overwhelmed, but being underwhelmed can be just as bad. Like when you're on a familiar road or when you're simply driving for a really long time, it becomes easier to tune out from what's happening on the road. And as cars are being developed to become smarter and do more of the driving for you, the risks of boredom on the road get higher. Because when we do less and less, it becomes harder for our minds to snap back and take control when we need to. To tackle this, researchers are tinkering with ways to artificially add some workload when drivers are understimulated. For instance, a 2017 study had participants drive in a simulator with and without a kind of smartphone game that encouraged them to stick to changing speed limits. The phone was positioned in a legally allowed holder, and the game was designed to avoid being too showy or distracting. When the game was introduced, the participants drove with less risky behavior, like speeding, and stayed more engaged on the otherwise quiet, boring roads in the simulator. Which is not to say that playing games while driving is something that you should do, but it goes to show boredom can affect how much attention you're paying to what you're doing. So while some machines doing our jobs might make us tune out, there's a hope that soon they'll also be able to help us tune back in. And not all of us are driving around with AI sensors that keep us at the perfect amount of stimulation, so there's still some progress to be made. But it looks like we're getting better and better at using AI to help improve our lives. If your AI interest isn't satiated, you can check out this SciShow video about how artificial intelligence can be a great lab assistant for research like figuring out what proteins look like. Thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode of SciShow, and thank you for watching.